next series of Leaders for Humanity, um, the urgent case for a civil economy. And it's a wonderful pleasure to have here with us today uh, Stefano Zomani, a very um, renowned professor of economics, and I gladly have to say um, one of my own professors whilst I was doing my management degree. Um, what we will do today, as usual, is going to be uh, uh, three things. I will briefly introduce the project that uh, we have started about good organizations. We will then introduce Stefano in proper terms um, for a second, and then we will go into the discussion about um, Stefano's work on the civil economy and how it could link to the Good Organizations project. So very briefly then, as always, um, the discussion about our Good Organizations project. Good Organizations is all about how we can develop organizations that are both e efficient and ethical. And we have started to um, look into uh, a number of um, innovative thoughts and, and research that relates to building organizations that can become responsible actors within a good society that can build a container for employees to flourish and develop, and that can look at the individuals themselves and offer them opportunities to find um, and live a good, authentic life as employees um, for themselves. And we are trying to engage in this journey of inquiry a number of different constituents as uh, um, free thinkers who are developing alternative ideas about how we could um, progress from our current capitalistic paradigm, university research and academics who are looking into evidence of the effectiveness of our current theories and potential alternative approaches, but also business leaders and um, renowned thinkers and academics who can provide a personal perspective on what has worked and what hasn't worked. And in this context, the series today is really focused on um, Professor Zamani's view in practice and in theory of how to take us forward into a new paradigm. And without further ado, I will hand over to Antoinette to introduce Stefano and um, then allow uh, Stefano Zamani to give us a few perspectives in his own words about his own career. Antoinette, over to you to introduce yes. um, Stefano. We are very honored to have Professor Stefano at this university former Dean of University of Bologna and um, President of the Pontifical Academy of Social Science, which we will see um, plays a role in his writings. He has written various books um, about the history of economic thought, civil um, on social choice theory, on economic epistemology, and I have to say I learned something, axiology, which already says something about our um, economic science um, that we haven't talked about that in any other classes. So for me and for us, reading his works was a revelation, as he's a really true polymath, I find so, one of the rare heterodox economists who really dares to critique standard economics. There are still not enough out there, uh, in our opinion. And for us all, deep understanding of a hopeful narrative building on Catholic social teaching, on the common good, and on virtue ethics. So this is surely something we are really very, very intrigued with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Antonietta and, and Otti for the invitation, which I very happily accepted. So let me start in answering your initial remarks with the following consideration. The firm performs uh, right from the beginning many functions in society. However, a reductionist mentality and the culture has made it in recent times, to be precise, in the last 50 years, more or less, a sort of money-making machine. In other words, it, this reductionism, which is still dominant nowadays, made 
the uh, refuses to consider that the firm is actually a political agent. By political agent, I mean an agent of transformation of the context of the reality in which the firm operates. Now, this uh, uh, view, uh, it's as old as at the beginning, the birth of the market economy. As we know, the market economy was born in the 15th century at the time of what is called the civil humanism. And the cradle of uh, that was, uh, as you know, Tuscany and in particular Florence. Already Dante in his uh, comedy mentioned something, even though he anticipated the event. If we consider the work by Cotrulli, a famous entrepreneur of the time, Leonardo da Vinci, because Leonardo da Vinci was an entrepreneur, not only the scientist, the painter, as famous as he, but he was a, basically an entrepreneur, Albertano from Brescia and many others, etc. And even in recent times, consider the figure of Adriano Olivetti. Adriano Olivetti passed away in 1960, or people like Andrew Carnegie in the United States and many, many others. So the idea was that the firm is not only a, a money-making machine, that is a reductive, but is to be visualized as a, an agent as I said, of transformation. So in the last, as I said, 50 years, more or less, a, a new trend in economic thinking, which nowadays is heavily criticized, started defining the firm as a nexus of contracts. That is a famous expression going back to Ronald Coase and many other authors whom I do not need to mention now. In other words, uh, as an entity which has a single purpose, namely profit maximization. Uh, that is a novelty because as I said a minute ago, in the past was not like that. And uh, what happened? In inevitably, we have uh, recorded positive effects because uh, increments of profitability increments of productivity, of efficiency, no doubt. We have to admit that, that this new conceptualization of the firm as the nexus of contracts, as a sort of a technocratic machinery to generate a profit, operated all over the world, in particular in the Western world, with the positive results I missed. But that occurred at a price. The price has been is three. The first one is the phenomenon of teleopathy. Teleopathy, it's an expression, by the way, it's a Greek word, but is uh, heavily utilized uh, in the jargon of business administration, which means that uh, an agent pursues uh, a single purpose. And uh, the implication of that is disconnection from society. So now we observe that uh, the vast majority of CEOs, of business leaders, etc., are really disconnected from society. They say, if you talk to them, they would say, I, have, I bother only about my business, about my entity. This is a phenomenon which is called teleopathic behavior. The second uh, result, negative result, is the so-called cut flowers syndrome. I'm sure that you heard this expression other times. What do we mean by cut flower syndrome? That the language of values is uh, utilized and repeated, but uh, disconnected from the spiritual roots. In other words, uh, today people talk about fundamental values, such as uh, fundamental human rights, freedom, uh, justice, equity, etc. But these are only words. These words are not followed by actual practical consequences. That is the so-called cut flower syndrome. You cut the flowers and after a while outside the 
the original plant, the, the flower vanishes. The third phenomenon, which is a result, a consequence of the uh, reductionist mood taken in, in general in the last 50 years, is the phenomenon of moral disengagement. I use this expression in the sense of Albert Bandura. Albert Bandura is a psycho American psychologist. He published in the year 2016, five years ago, a fundamental book whose title is Moral Disengagement. What is that about? Moral disengagement is a cognitive process that serves to disactivate the mechanism that serves to avoid actions contrary to our own principles. In other words, uh, people speak on certain principles and they declare obedience, but they try to find justification in order to uh, promote themselves and considering themselves not liable for what they do. Typical example, everybody today is against pollution, generation of CO2, CF4, etc. Everybody says that he or she wants to defend the environment, but in the actual organization of the firm, the behavior is such that uh, many perverse effects in this regard. This is a case of moral disagreement, which is very subtle. Because if you declare that you do, did not care less about environment, one could argue. But with people who accept the fundamental premises, there is no way of arguing. Because he or she would say, I agree. The point is that they tend to behave in an opposite way, finding justification for that. Just to give you another example, another example, a different, nothing to do with the firm. Like those who say, I am against, uh, uh, let's say, writing against the uh, women discrimination, etc. But what I did is because she was in agreement with me. That is a typical example of moral disengagement, etc. So now that is what we should be aware of what is happening today at the world level. In other words, uh, uh, my, let's say, approach or my main point is that we should uh, go back to the past. We cannot continue to consider the firm as, as I said, uh, uh, rep representing only one single purpose, because that does not make sense at all from any point of view. And the impact or at the personal level of this situation, it's uh, very well known. One is burnout. Second, dequalification. I read recently an empirical work saying that almost 90%, 90% of working time of a CEO or of a general director is spent in um, meetings in controlling the work of others etc but that's unbelievable people who having a certain experience having studied they spend most of their time to do this type of jobs that is why this satisfaction it's a uh, uh, it's at the center of this and that is why as you know in recent times uh, many firms big corporations the first one was google they introduced in their or internal organization CHO, which means Chief Happiness Officer. And the CHO is somebody who tries to solve problems connected to the actual organization of internal work in order to avoid the perverse phenomena I was talking about a minute ago. Now, having said so, the question can be posed in the following way. If um, profit maximization is not the only purpose, of course, profits are important, it should be done. Well, I would like to stress the adverb only, 
is, nobody denies that a firm in order to continue to exist in the market should realize profit. The problem is that that is not enough. So what else is the, what is another purpose which should be joined to profit maximization? I do not hesitate to indicate inclusiveness. Inclusiveness today, it's a key word. As you know, some people, many different parts of the world have indicated that inclusiveness is essential to the future of capitalism, or better to say, to the capitalistic market economy. Uh, until recently, we believed that, that efficiency in the strict sense of the world was enough to guarantee the uh, continuation, but that is not true. Only people who do not know economic theory properly can say nothing. Because unless uh, the capitalistic market uh, indicates as a perspective, at least, that uh, the alternate purpose is inclusive prosperity, sooner or later, the market capitalism will enter into major crisis. And when we talk about the inclusion or inclusiveness, we refer not only to economic inclusion, but also social inclusiveness and cultural inclusion. So inclusiveness has a three dimensions, not only one. And then um, if that is the situation, the problem is that uh, today what we observe is that we do not lack highly qualified CEO from a professional point of view. We lack leadership in a generic sense. In other words, people showing character skills, we are able to realize in concrete terms the purpose of inclusiveness. And that is a racist point. We should, if I were a CEO together with my colleague, I would insist more and more on the so-called business schools. Because in my opinion, not all, but the vast majority of business schools operating at the university level in our societies are obsolete. Go and check the curricula. If you read the curricula, not only the title, but the, the whole, uh, uh, let's say, uh, elements of the various, various uh, courses, they are obsolete they refer to the period that I am criticizing. So the a major a target of the group of CEO is to insist with the major business schools that time has come to modify the content of the curricula and to modify the perspective. Uh, Otherwise, uh, we will never be able to get out uh, of the present situation. And so the question again becomes, why do so many companies resist a change? In spite of the fact that a change is good for business, that is a, a $1 trillion question. Because if one could say, I do not want to change because I have reasons to believe that change will deteriorate my situation, I could understand. But it's not true. It's not true. Unless uh, we change uh, not so much the business model, but the organizational model of the firm, the risk of disappearance are enormous. Let me just give three possible answers to the question that I have just posed. The first one is a lack of proper culture. Now, I found recently, a, I quote, I better quoting, an article by David Brooks, a columnist for the New York Times. Listen what he wrote a few years ago. I quote, a society is healthy when its culture counterbalances its economics. When you have a capitalist economic system, that emphasizes competition 
dynamism, individual self-interest, you need a culture that celebrates cooperation, stability, and a committed relationship. Our culture today, David Brooks adds, takes the disruptive and dehumanizing aspect of capitalism and makes them worse. I couldn't believe, because I mean, he's a, a journalist, very highly quoted, but he's right. The point is that he talks about counterbalance. It's not, a, in other words, a, to deny what is occurring. The problem is that that is not enough. And we keep on forgetting that we have to complement what our business world is doing with the other uh, components uh, that he mentioned, cooperation, stability, committed relationship, etc. A second reason has to do with the fact that um, what um, Professor Bruno Frey, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, and who, somebody whom, of which I have great esteem, talked about uh, intrinsic motivations. Now, he says, and also other people say, that uh, the motivational system of human beings is twofold. There are people who are motivated to act mainly or basically from extrinsic motivations and others from intrinsic motivations. Of course, each one of us has both of them. The problem is the proportion. There are people who, for let's say, just to give you stupid, give you stupid number, 95% operates for extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation means, uh, for instance, the money that I get uh, if I do a certain job or profit maximization. But there are other people who, in their, let's say, moral constitution, operate in order to uh, realize intrinsic motivation. In other words, they do what they do because they believe in what they are doing. And they believe that what they are doing is for the common good. In that case, we say that fellow, that economic agent, agent operates via intrinsic motivation. That is uh, the point. The point is that, uh, again, uh, the responsibility of scholars, professors, the, which is the category to which I myself belong, is very high. Because we, in general, of course, there are exceptions, we are misbehaving. Because we continue to teach in our, to our students at university, just it is enough to take any textbooks in microeconomics or macroeconomics, to get that uh, to be rational is uh, to maximize extrinsic motivation. But that is not true at all. That is dogmatism. That is not science. And uh, important scholars in the international level, they believe that they are scientists, which is not true. Because as we know from empirical analysis, that uh, there is a, a I wouldn't say majority, but an important percentage of economic agents who operate out of intrinsic motivation. So how can you pretend to teach a theory as if it were the theory? So we, you are doing in this way, this education and above all, you are spreading the idea according to which if one operates out of an intrinsic motivation, it's not rational. And that is not true. Because rationality, as you know, has two dimensions. Uh, there is a, a instrumental rationality and expressive rationality. But why economists keep on talking only about uh, instrumental rationality? That is uh, another big mistake. So the, the second reason I believe that we are not uh, providing in the organization of our work and the organization of market enough, let's say, incentive to the so-called intrinsic motivation. And that is something that can be, and in fact, in certain countries, in limited uh, amount, that is going on. In other words, uh, the system 
the legal system should uh, take that into consideration, not uh, to uh, give um, incentives uh, or prizes only to those uh, who are motivated uh, in the other in the other way, etc. So that is, in my opinion, today the major, uh, so to speak, challenge uh, facing uh, the the world. Uh, of um, our companies and in particular of the our managers ceo general director whatsoever and i have reasons to believe that something will change very soon if we take the so-called uh, round table the economic round table of exactly two years ago in the year 2019 august 2019 uh, the famous uh, declaration we can find exactly that a certain number of outstanding CEOs subscribe exactly this uh, consideration. Certainly, it's not enough, one could say, to state, we need also to transform into practice. But unless we change the cultural mode, we, unless we change the social norms of behavior, it is obvious that such a change cannot be operated. To conclude, that this is what the economic paradigm, which is called the civil economy paradigm, is uh, teaching, is uh, trying to di with dialogue with others to express uh, in a free way. And uh, to remind those who perhaps never occurred to know about the civil economy, it is proper to remember that the first academic academic chair in economy in the world was established by the University of Naples in the year 1753. 1753. So economics as a science, academic, not as practice, of course, but as a guy, was established in Naples. And that chair was called the chair on civil economy. And the first chair professor was um, a man from Salerno, nearby Naples, whose name was Antonio Genovese. Now, we know that uh, the book of Antonio Genovese was published much before the book by Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nation, in the year 1776. And uh, many points of the wealth of nations are taken from Genovese because Adam Smith happened to know Genovese thought through one of his disciples because Adam Smith spent some time in Paris and in Paris he met one of the disciples of Antonio Genovese and he was explained to them. That is important because the civil economy paradigm from a, a historical point of view comes before the paradigm of political economy as it was called in the anglo-saxon world etc now okay. both of them are important they overlap but there are also many differences between the two and it is proper today to maintain the two in a sort of a dialogue or even sometimes a dialectical dialogue because we have to pick up from both paradigms the best of what they can offer. Wonderful. And I think a brilliant introduction, uh, caro professore. And um, you've touched on many of the subjects that really interest us very profoundly. So I think if you allow us, we will build now on your first statements and try to dig a little bit deeper to gain a full understanding of some of your points. And I want to start with your last sentence, because I think what you're arguing in your books is there was a European version of a civil economy paradigm long before the political economy or capitalistic paradigm. So I would like you to maybe clarify for our listeners two things. One, you always say market is the genus, capitalism is the species. Can you just explain what you mean? And then the second question is, 
why has capitalism prevailed, whereas the European idea has mostly disappeared? Okay, thank you very much, Ob. Now, it is true. First of all, the word paradigm is a Greek word. In Greek, paradigm means view. So a paradigm is not a theory, it's not a model. A paradigm is a particular view of reality. So when we talk about a civil economy paradigm and a political economy paradigm, we are referring to two different views of the world, what the Germans call Weltanschauung, the Weltanschauung. Ontology, now, it, basically. Yes, it is true that the, the civil economy paradigm is basically and mainly continental European. On the other hand, the political economy paradigm is basically and mainly Anglo-Saxon. So that is important to, to fix uh, uh, to fix the historical truth. Now, market economy is the genus. Capitalism, market economy is a species. Why is that so? Because as nowadays, everybody knows, because after the work of many important historians that has been fixed, eh? market economy was born three centuries before the birth of capitalism. The market economy, as I said before, was born between the 14th and 15th century, when capitalism did not exist yet. Uh, there is an important book published two years ago by a Dutch scholar. His name is Basil von Bavel. Von Bavel. It's a fascinating book. He's an historian. And uh, he can ex he explain that with a, a great uh, deal of, uh, uh, of specifics uh, what I just said. In other words, uh, the market economy was born uh, in a period when the necessity to obtain, to reach the so-called common good was mature. We had to wait, as I said, a bit less than three centuries before the market economy transformed itself into capitalistic market economy, which became, reached its, uh, let's say, top at the time of the first industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution, the, the, the second part of the 18th century in England, never forget, because the first industrial revolution was born in England. Second industrial revolution was born in Germany, one century later, at the end, towards the end of the 19th century, etc. So that is the reason why a market economy is the genus because uh, it uh, generated a new way to organize uh, the productive process, the consumption distribution, uh, the labor process, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this distinction was not known at his time by Karl Marx. If he could uh, read certain books in Italian, perhaps he would not have written what he wrote. Why? Because he identified the market economy with capitalism. And since uh, he was against capitalism, then he said, we have to abolish market economy. So that is uh, the reason of the distinction. Uh, as I said, to conclude, Marx identified the two. And since he was against capitalism, for the reasons that we know more or less, he said, we have to uh, supersede or take over the market economy. And that is the reason why, for instance, Lenin, when he did the revolution in Russia in 1972, what he did was to cancel uh, the markets and introducing uh, central planning. Central planning is the result. And that was, of course, a theoretical mistake because you can have uh, a market economy which uh, uh, operates in such a way as to avoid the phenomena usually associated until recently to the capitalistic mode of production, such as uh, exploitations, uh, in, in, 
uh, increments of, uh, of uh, let's say inequalities, uh, uh, environmental destruction, etc. In other words, it is possible to have a flourishing market economy, even avoiding the phenomena that we are nowadays aware of. I repeat, a tremendous increase in inequalities. Read the book by Branko Milanovic to have a, one of the most recent demonstrations of that. Second, environmental degradation, that is obvious. Uh, and third, the phenomena which I call the exploitation, the fact that uh, the labor process uh, is organized in such a way not to make people happy, happy in which sense, in the sense of allowing them to develop their, let's say, talents, their gifts, uh, but uh, in a more humane way. And that is the challenge of today. Because unless we reason in this way, what is the danger? The danger is that people go ahead as usual, business as usual, but that is not sustainable. It is not sustainable. It, there are proofs of it. Or people who speak uh, of the necessity of a type of revolution. In my opinion, both attitudes are wrong. What is true, on the other hand, is to find ways which they do exist to reduce inequalities, Second, to stop with uh, environmental degradation. And third, uh, giving to human labor, in a sense, uh, a restitution to human labor of its uh, fundamental meaning, which is uh, human flourishing. And that is possible. And that is why when I talk to CEOs, to the most intelligent, they understand that. Uh, and in fact, uh, a certain number of that have already started this sort of transition. They are still in minority, but of course, the things take time. What is important is to have clear the final target to be achieved. Okay, I'm very sorry for all these um, problems with the sound, but I just kind of try to um, ask something in between of the many interesting things you were saying, but I would like to drill down a little bit more on the common good, because I think this is so essential. And it's also essential in the end that you say that companies should have a, should be common good companies. But before we go into there, um, I'm, I'm really intrigued. Could you tell us a little bit more about the common good and how is that different from um, more the integral good, for instance? And maybe, uh, Professor, if we go on, so how do you define common good? What is the common good? How no. does it link to relational good and gratuitousness? Because you talk about donor and the concept of gratuity, so to speak. So common good versus yeah. relational good versus gratuitousness, and maybe even versus public good, just to help people to orient themselves. How would you explain? Okay. Common good is not to be confused with commons. Uh, even though the wording uh, might uh, help to confuse. Now, the common good is the alternative to total good. And to the benefit of my students, already a certain number of years ago, I introduced uh, an arithmetical metaphor, which I noticed that it works perfectly. Make people, everybody, even though people have, did not study economics to understand the difference between common good and total good. The difference is the following. Uh, the, sorry, the metaphor is the sum, is the form. A total good is a sum total, namely the sum total of individual goods. We are, uh, is what is called nowadays a gross domestic product. The gross domestic product is a total good, which is generated in a, in a country, in a time span of one or few years, etc. So it's my good measured in a way or the other that is irrelevant, plus your good, plus the other one good. The common good, on the other hand, is a product, a multiplication. It's the multiplication of product of individual goods. Now, what is the difference in arithmetic between a sum total and the product? 
de different entry schools they teach. In a sum total, even though some addenda vanish, the sum total remains positive. In other words, uh, even though some uh, addenda of the, the sum total disappear or go to zero, provided that the other addenda remain positive, the sum total is positive. Or could be that if I abolish your personal good in order because you are less efficient than Otti and I give the resources given to you to Otti, Supposing that OT is more efficient, the total sum will increase, which is what happens nowadays. When people say we have to transfer resources from those workers who are less productive to those who are more productive. Now, in the logic of the common good, you cannot do that. Why? Because in a product, even though one factor goes to zero, the total product uh, sorry, the, the, um, uh, the product goes to zero. Zero multiplied one million is a zero. Zero plus one million is one million. Which means that in the logic of, that is the final point, in the logic of the common good, you cannot separate the moment of production of income from the moment of its distribution. In the logic of total good, you separate. And that explains what we are observing today. At the world level, the total good is increasing. Even now, even uh, in the last years, still inequalities are increasing. Ask yourself, how is it possible? It is as if I once said, the cake, the cake increases year after year, but the slices occurring going to certain groups of people diminish. But in I, the logic think, of common good, that is not possible because the two moments cannot be separated. And now, I think in, in, the, in that sense, sorry? where is the echo coming from? Sorry? I don't, in that sense, I think this notion of common good is linking, I believe, in your writings to two other things. One, the notion of liberty which you have defined somewhere as the combination of autonomy, I think um, immunity and capability. And you have also stated that your civil economy concept is trying to bridge a social democratic perspective or a socialistic perspective even with a libertarian perspective, which only cater to partial aspects of that liberty, which again, I would suggest also links to the Catholic social thinking and in your interpretation of integrative human development. So could you maybe um, bring in here the Catholic thought, Amartya, Amartya Zen's uh, capability notion and your understanding of liberty? How does all of that link to what you just explained in terms of common good? Yes, thank you. You are right. The notion, the roots, cultural roots of common goods are in the Catholic realm. After the reform, the idea of total good came up. That is, I know that certain people dislike that, but that is a historical truth. Because the notion of common good, we can be found already in the works of the so-called fathers of the church. Consider Basilius from Caesarea. He was the bishop of Caesarea in the year three, uh, 370, 370, he published a, a beautiful, most beautiful booklet. The title is On the Good Use of Riches. Try to read it. That is 1,700 years ago. He already made it clear the distinction I was uh, drawing now using modern language. Because he said that you cannot be uh, worried only to enlarge the, the cake, so to speak. You have also to consider how those who participated to the creation of the cake should, uh, should be admitted into its division. Second, you should not exclude 
from the participation to the productive process of anybody. An idea which was taken much later by St. Francis. When St. Francis, before dying, he asked to write in the so-called regula, regula, the following, I want that everybody should work. Not only the most equipped, the most intelligent, the most productive, everybody. And if one is handicapped, less talented, we should be able to find adjusting the organization of work, the position adaptable to that person. In other words, it is the productive process which should adapt itself to the human condition of people, not vice versa, as it was with the notion of total good. Now, these things are written. It is enough to read them. Of course, one could say it is much easier or much preferable to do, but that is not true because it's not efficient. Because that is why we have to invent the welfare state. The welfare state was invented in order to cope with the, 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 the black point, black holes of the total good conception in order to maintain in existence those. But if everybody had the work, there would be no need of welfare state. <laughs> so from a, even a, a technical point of view, the, the total good perspective is not efficient. Because it is true that if you offer jobs to the most qualified, you increase. But then you have to consider how much you have to spend in order to support using assistentialistic uh, uh, actions of one type or the other, those who have been excluded. Not to mention that those excluded sooner or later might react, might do even violent uh, reaction, etc. So it, I, um, I, I always ask myself why people, intelligent people, do not consider that. You cannot consider the economic sphere separated from the other spheres of society. Because people react, and we know from the reality how they react uh, many times in violent ways. So that is why, to conclude, even from an efficiency point of view, it is not true that the total good, not to mention the fact that if you do not uh, take into consideration in the company accounting, for instance, the negative externalities, if I pollute, that is a negative externality. But the cost of the pollution are not included. And so that is why you can say I have increased the profit. But the, and we can be sure that already perhaps next year, a major modification will be introduced at the international level, imposing to the firms to, 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 to say, deliver the balance sheets uh, take into consideration the cost uh, of externalities, negative externalities. And then we will see um, a lot of difference, etc. So that is but why is that, is that I believe not, that uh, the perspective sorry, sorry of the for, common good that today is superior to I, I want to come in there with one, one quick point, um, Stefano, which is the argument that it's more efficient. As you say yourself, efficiency can only ever be a secondary condition and subsidiarity has to be towards the uh, the endless the, the infinite value of the person right is is that not a wrong argument are you not making a consequentialist no. argument a utilitarian argument about efficiency rather than a moral argument to say independent of whether it's more efficient in creating total gdp you have to look after your neighbor which, which would you. be the Christian argument. Thank you. Now, the notion of efficiency was introduced for the first time by Wilfredo Pareto, the famous Italian economist, at the end of the 19th century. Be careful. But Pareto said that there are two notions of efficiency, not one, that he called efficiency of a limited efficiency and utility efficiency. If you do not believe me, ask any economist. And uh, if you say 
who invented the Ebu dance Pareto. And then you say, Pareto, did he give one unique definition or so too? Most economists do not know yet because of a limited efficiency is efficiency referring to the individual agents. And so I, for instance, as a consumer or as an entrepreneur, I am efficient in the of a limited sense if I do things in such a way as to increase my utility function. On the other hand, the utility efficiency refer, refers itself to the whole society. And Pareto added, it might be the case that certain actions are of a limited efficient, but not utility efficient, and which is exactly what is happening today. And but still, most economists do not know the things. Ignorance is terrible. Because when Pareto passed away in the year 1923, 1923, what happened after a few years that uh, the neoclassical schools conflated the two notions and so made us believe that uh, if I am efficient for me, for the same reasons, ipso facto, I am also efficient for the whole society, which is not true at all. And the one who, he, who discovered that, uh, in, no, many, the, who denounced that was Pope Francis in the Evangelic Gaudio, when he said the so-called trickle-down effect is not correct. And he was initially, as you know, very criticized, but now everybody understands that he was right. In other words, a trickle-down nowadays has become trickle-up. Not trickle-down, but trickle-up. And the reason is exactly that. When we talk about the thesis, we have always to stay to conclude. Efficient with respect to what? To the individual utility or social utility? I think you, you made that point also very nicely. This is um, towards this atomistic, the methodological individualism, which is kind of blinding us completely to what you're saying. Um, and then, of course, you juxtapose that with your relational view. Um, and here I'm just wondering, um, and Otti took that up already a little bit, um, I find your reciprocity idea also a very special one, because your reciprocity is a generous reciprocity, is a, a friendship-driven reciprocity. Um, so is this so difficult for us to understand? Is it difficult for us to model, which probably is the case? Is it difficult for us to live in companies? Why can't we take that on board in a, in a big degree? Thank you, Antoinette. That is a very important question. Now, let me answer this way. As we know, there are different categories of goods in uh, any society, in any community. Private goods, public goods, common goods, uh, commons, common goods, uh, relational goods uh, uh, and positional goods, five categories. Nobody talks about positional goods, uh, what can you do? But it was Thomas Schelling, Nobel Prize, American economist, who was uh, among the first uh, to open our vista on positional, but I'm not talking about it. Relational goods uh, were known uh, since a long time ago, to sociologists and psychologists. They enter the realm of economics in the year 1989. You people, perhaps uh, when I say a few things, they cannot believe. Only recently they entered, and they entered in the same year, they appeared in two papers, one in America, one in Italy. The one in America was by a lady, Carol Hulaner, the one in Italy by Professor Luigi Gui from Padua. He also belonged to it. Now, they did not know each other, but in the same year, they said, we have to enrich the economic uh, horizon because uh, private goods are important, very important, but they are not enough. Even public goods are not enough. 
we need to add other categories of goods if we want to make to achieve the ultimate purpose which means public happiness public happiness and so that is what we have to face today that today many people talk about the relational goods because they cannot do otherwise because a, a relational good is a good whose utility depends on the interpersonal relations. But this is the typical example of relational good, friendship. Friendship, friendship is a relational good. It's not a private good, not even a public good. The same with many other a working relations. If I am a worker, you are my boss. Between you and me, you, you can organize the productive process in such a way as in a, with my activity, I develop my, let's say, potential, my natural gifts, and the same applies, to, et cetera. So today, what we are witnessing, and that explains the crisis of mainstream economics, because mainstream economics, it's okay with private goods and public goods. Nothing to it. But when you come to relational goods, common good, and uh, the third category, which I left aside, there are an example of a common good, which is environment. The air, water, it's a common good. It's, uh, the water in the oceans does not belong to me, to you, to, to a country. It's a common good. And why? We, we are witnessing the tragedy of commons, to repeat the title of the famous uh, 1968 uh, article. Exactly because even today, mainstream economics has no theory of common goods. No theory, not even one. I bet. There are hints. The it only one true. which exists well, I mean, comes, exactly, comes not from economics, yeah. but from political scientists and from a lady yeah. <laughs> Eleanor Ostrom. Eleanor Ostrom yeah. received the Nobel Prize in economics, but she was political scientist, not economist. And the book which she published in 1990, the title being Governing the Commons, it's a, a landmark. Mm -hmm. But what I said, within mainstream economics, there is no way. And the reason is, I come to the point because to operate with both common goods and relational goods, you have to introduce the principle of reciprocity. Mm -hmm. Which and I think brings me to the you. paradigm is unable to do. They will never be able to deal because the mainstream, they understand the principle of exchange of equivalence, but not the principle of reciprocity. Yeah. And that is, is that a not, I think the question then becomes, as, as Antoinette said, why is this lacking? Um, if, if we look at Robert Putnam's work, right, where he writes in Upswing that we have from a we society turned to an I society with the New Deal after the Second World War, again, a collaborative society. And today we have the maximum individualistic society. I just wonder, you wrote in 2008, also commenting on um, uh, some, some again, Catholic writings that the crisis was giving you hope that the conditions for a significant societal change would come. You're saying the same today, but 15 years have passed. And has anything changed? What is giving you hope that this reciprocity or fraternity, as you say in other terms, is actually building up again? Yes, because uh, you see, um, because human beings, they need both relational goods and common goods. It is a fundamental necessity. When we are very, very poor and we are hungry, what do we want? Private goods. A typical example of a private good is food. If you are hungry or if you are sick, you need a medicine. That is a private good. But when you develop over time, sooner or later, the demand 
of relational goods and common goods in terms, in relative terms, in other words, the first derivative becomes superior to the demand of private goods. The, the increment, I'm talking of the increments, not the total. So that is the point, that people are opening their eyes nowadays because they said, we are fed up. We are having too many private goods and in fact, uh, we throw away food, uh, we throw away garments, we throw away everything, plastic bags, etc. But we are suffering out of a scarcity of relational goods. For instance, for our children at school or for our people in the hospitals, etc. And then you can make the list. So that is what makes me hopeful. Because sooner or later, people will react, in particular the young the younger generation, because the younger generation was born, at, at least in the Western world, eh, in the Western world, was born in a, in a situation where food was no longer scarce and medicine, etc. So what they really uh, want eh, is eh, to live in a society where the spirit of community is getting more and more ground. When people perceive that, the situation is very close to be changed. And we have many, many, because that in concrete terms is actuated, how? By putting into work the principle of subsidiarity. In other this words, uh, if subsidiarity is the, the, the actual, so to speak, uh, means in order to give to the principle of reciprocity a concrete uh, evidence, etc. In other words, uh, today everybody knows that the bipolar model of social order based on state and market is not enough. We need a tripolar state market community. And uh, three, these are uh, three poles or three pillars. They have, uh, they have uh, to find the ways of not only communicating, but cooperating among themselves. That is the challenge of the new economics. That is the challenge also of what I said at the beginning of the firms. Because these things, the firms, the entrepreneurs, the, the business leaders, they understand much, much better and more than many economists who are still sticked to a paradigm which is correct, but is obsolete. Does not take into account the new necessity. And that is uh, what makes me hopeful. People, I think especially, a, and uh, the, the, the best uh, CEOs, they understand the things they are modifying and they are pushing. Because since they are strong enough, they can push who? Political leaders, for instance, to modify the system of laws still operating in our societies. But is there, and I, um, the, the notion of a third pillar as community, I think sounds very similar to what Henry Minsberg is advertising with his rebalancing society and the plural sector, which I think um, you have uh, suggested is not a good name for the third sector. But um, I wonder, almost in a Marxist fashion, is that revolution really happening? Paul Adler is talking about the 99% economy where already in the United States, 1% of the population has 90% of net worth, right? A uh, thousand companies have 80% of the assets. So we have come to a concentration of power in our current structure that potentially is becoming a huge bulwark for change, even if there is a, a great minority that is asking for what you are describing. Are you comfortable that even if after 2008, which arguably was one of the greatest crises of capitalism, very little has changed. Are you still confident that in the short term we're going to see societal upheaval and, and, and modification of the system? And may I just quickly chip in, because I'm a professor for HR, so I have lots to do with um, CEOs and CHROs and even chief happiness officers. What I can't see is they let go that they would let go of what you have called sin structures. So they cling to their incentives. So we still have a lot of crowding out of intrinsic motivation. Um, 
There's a lot of positional competition within the companies because they work with tournaments within the companies. So, I mean... Um, CEO pay. Yeah, and CEO pay, we just had another um, big um, problem with that in Switzerland, even with a cooperative. So, I'm kind of just um, want to chip in here. Um, what can we do? Where can we go further? Or, or do we, in the end, have to go to democratic socialism, or is this just the worst we could do? Now, yes, these are relevant, uh, relevant questions. The answer can be synthesized in one word, namely sustainability. Now, the word sustainability was coined, do you know when? In 1793, for the first time before did not exist. By whom? By a German scientist whose name was von Karlowitz, 1793. But after a few years, the word disappeared. It's only in the last 20, a quarter of a century, that the word of sustainability. And today, it's almost an inflated word. Everybody talks about sustainability. But there is a reason. And why, to answer your question, the answer is in the sustainability, because in particular, the big corporation, what you ought to said in terms of concent sorry, concentration of economic power, uh, they are realizing that their future is uh, connected to sustainability, not only ecological sustainability, but social sustainability and economic sustainability. So it is a paradox. Paradox is a Greek word, which means a surprise. It's a paradox that are the top big companies which today talk about uh, sustainability, the necessity to guarantee sustainability. The sm small, medium-sized firms, they have something else to think about. But why then they are talking? For three reasons. In other words, uh, there are three reasons why, in particular, the bigger corporations are worried about uh, sustainability. The first, that uh, rising inequality reflects uh, the economic rents uh, captured in resource extraction and production, and uh, which means uh, that when the proportion of rents overtake the proportion of Profits, that is the end. That's it. That was already anticipated by the great English economist David Ricardo in 1820, when he says the proportion of rent in the GDP cannot have a share larger than 15, 16 percent. A certain amount of rent is unavoidable and sometimes even necessary, but not more than today. Rents is more than double than that figure, particularly in my country, in Italy. But you understand that when rents uh, destroys both wages and profits, and so the real entrepreneurs are worried. The second reason is that inequality fosters plutocracy. Plut you know, plutocracy is just the opposite to democracy. Yeah, but that is a serious business. Eh? Because, you see, everybody wants a democracy. Because the very day that we jeopardize the roots of the democratic setup, you understand, even the giant, the big corporation will disappear. The third reason is that the rising inequality is an indicator of financial instability. Financial instability, which increases the probability of an impending crash. The financial crisis 2007-2008 was caused by what? Exactly by that. And uh, it is obvious that both uh, the, 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 the industrialists and those working in the finance sector, they know that uh, instability is financial instability is for them a, a major risk. So, it is not only for moral reasons that uh, I expect uh, 
important changes in the near future. And that would be enough. Now, ask yourself, why a figure like that of Pope Francis is so well known all over the world? Tell me. Do you know that uh, Laudato Si is the book mostly quoted at the world level, not only by the Catholics, but by the others? Now, tell me why. I was, uh, I did know, I happened to know recently, that those who got the translation of Fra Laudato Si in Russian were not, was not the Orthodox Church, but were the Muslim, the Russian Muslim Church. And, and, and uh, when I asked the, 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 I don't know the name, the Mullah or something, said, because we realized that uh, that book represents uh, a major, let's say, break on the cultural front. So on culture more, but as I would like to stress, even from the economic world itself, there is a uh, many, many uh, interest to maintain sustainability. Not only, I repeat, ecological sustainability, which is in a sense is obvious, but in particular, political and economic because democracy otherwise will be jeopardized. And the very moment that we uh, get rid of democracy, that is uh, the end. And nobody wants the end uh, of uh, the present model of civilization. Of course, these are, in a sense, conjecture. We need to translate all these ideas into actual facts. And that is the role of people like you, or organizations like, like you who tend to spread this idea and uh, making people more hopeful to the fact that it is possible to change. The that famous uh, T Tina, T-I-N-A, don't believe that, by Mrs. Thatcher. There is no alternative. No, that is wrong, wrong, wrong. There is always an alternative in, in human history. That is the point. Let me, let me build on this. And I do agree with you. There is a necessity for a hopeful vision of the future. And I personally feel that even what we have today with SDGs uh, that the United Nations and the UN Compact are proposing or CSR or stakeholder theory, it's still, it's, it, it is at a very technical and very remote level that is not really creating a strong movement with the masses. But we are hopeful. I want to turn my attention more from the societal level to the organization itself. And we wanted to ask you first, maybe um, because you have written extensively about cooperatives, maybe to give us a little bit of a glimpse on kind of what is the history of cooperatives especially in Europe and especially in Italy. So what are the types of cooperatives and how does it relate to public companies? What can public companies learn from the example? Secondly, you also say with, I think you, you quote Karl Popper, with the open society, actually the cooperative model wasn't appropriate for the future anymore. So our question is, what is the structural kind of, what is the organizational structure that could become an operationalization of the civil economy? How should organizations look like in the future? Have you got some good Thank examples? You. So cooperatives and where would the future be? Now, the cooperative uh, type of, of form of firms is an offspring uh, of the industrial civilization. The first cooperative was established in England, Rochdale, a small village, in the year 1844. Existed before, but I'm talking of the first uh, uh, successful cooperative, 1844. So, cooperatives uh, are, in a sense, a consequence of the uh, following the first industrial revolution. And uh, at the beginning, then from uh, Rochdale, they spread in Germany, Italy, uh, Spain, uh, even in America, the United States. Today in the United States, uh, there is a huge cooperative movement. People do not know there are more than 4 million 
copper, four million copper. And uh, at the beginning, what was the, so to, so to say, so to speak, the justification? To use a Latin expression, they were born subspecie, subspecie povertatis. In other words, they were born in order to cope with extreme poverty of the people. Just because the times of the Industrial Revolution, we can imagine how they were. And uh, the situation evolved, and today we cannot justify cooperatives on that ground. Because to cope with poverty, absolute poverty, there are many other instruments at the public level or even at the government level, etc. So what is the justification today of a cooperative firm? To answer this question, we have to consider that the competitive principle and the cooperative principles, as I said before, quoting David Brooks, are the two faces of the same coin. Any society of any time needs both competition, but also cooperation. And in fact, a society will disappear if both, if only competition applies or only if cooperation applies. And the two principles need to be counterbalanced. Why? Because any productive organization is characterized by three elements, the purpose, the mission, and the identity. Now, the purpose of a firm is to generate value, not profit, but value. And value can take the forms of profit under certain circumstances. But any firm whatsoever, in order to justify its existence, is to generate value. From this point of view, on the basis of this element, there is no difference between a cooperative and a capitalistic firm. The difference appears with respect to the other two elements, mission and identity. Mission answer the question, how? Identity answer the question, why? Mission means how that particular organization, productive organization, obtains or generates value, increments of value. And then, the capitalistic firms follow a certain path, the cooperative follows another path. The third element is identity. And identity is the element answering the question, why? Why people in one type of firms operate in that way or in the other? So with respect with these two elements, what we observe is that the cooperative uh, the how problem realizes its plans of production by refusing, I am talking in principle, because in actuality there are false cooperatives, as you know. In any bucket there is a rotten apples, as we say. Uh, how? Using, not using the Tayloristic model of production. In other words, uh, Tayloris is based on the hierarchical principle. The one on top give orders, the other obey. In a cooperative organization, you have a more horizontal model of organization. A model which nowadays is called holocracy or holocratic model. But the holocratic model, holocracy, is the title of the book by Brian Robertson, professor at Harvard Business School published in the year 2007. And it is a scandal that many CEOs do not even heard about that. That is a scandal. Because you can reject it. You can criticize, but you need to know. Because Brian Robertson is professor at the Harvard Business School, the number one at the world level. And the holocracy is just the opposite to Taylorist work. Taylorism is vertical, holocracy is. With respect to identity, why? The cooperative indicates that those operating in it are more 
motivated by intrinsic motivation. You will never become a member of cooperative unless you have intrinsic motivation. If you have a mainly extrinsic motivation, you had better not work in a cooperative. Because in a cooperative, the principle of solidarity and the principle of subsidiarity is to put into action. And so you need uh, to have a motivation, for instance, could be justice, if you consider the socialist movement, social movement. or if you are Christian, you can have uh, other type of values. But in, the important thing is that you are, in a sense, pushed push to operate in a particular way because you have a particular reason to do that. Mm. So that is why we need, uh, in a prosperous society, to have uh, different types uh, of firms, capitalistic firms, uh, which are necessary. Necessary. I want to come in so here with the firms, and also today in America, the B Corp, Benefit Corporation. Which but I want to come in here with uh, with uh, with um, uh, a bit of a clarification, maybe, or a further question. So, in a cooperative being horizontally organized more than vertically organized, which also relates nicely to the relational models that Alan Fisk is talking about, right? And I think in, in our uh, inquiry so far, we've been trying to further define what Alan Fisk calls an equality sharing, a horizontal individualist model. And holacracy is one of the options that we've looked at together with Emanuele Quintarelli. We've also looked at sociocracy. We've also looked at highest model of microenterprises, right? So it is the bridging, which you describe in your work, of the three dimensions of liberty. It's the bridging the autonomy with participation, but under the subsidiarity of collective flourishing. And I think our question still is, what would that organization look like? So we would try to organize horizontally. We would try to give rise to individual intrinsic motivation. But I also think it requires a high degree of agency. And as Antoinette would say, it requires an ethos of interdependence, where with Amatya Zen's words, people would have to care about their co-workers to co-elevate. If they don't do that, such a system, in our belief, cannot work. What's your view? Oh, yeah, you are right, in fact. And in fact, eh, what you said is so right that we will never observe a cooperative firm operated, be careful, in a sector characterized by high capital intensity. As you know, uh, from a technical point of view, you can distinguish high capital intensive or labor intensive process. You will never observe a cooperative producing uh, ships. No. Why? Because in that particular type of activity, you need a, a, a big amount of capital. And then it is obvious the cooperative model is not fit. The opposite is true in other sectors. For instance, those the, with the a consumer, for instance. Why the consumer sector? Not the consumer, sorry. Uh, the the, 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 the so-called supermarkets in Italy ah. as well as in Europe are dominated by cooperatives. Because in that case, you do not need a big capital, fixed capital investment. You need a particular attention to the interest of a consumer who goes uh, to buy and to satisfy his or her visions of the world, for instance. Or, another example, services to the person. You will never observe, take, for instance, an hospital. Hospital. You can, uh, uh, why in America, the vast majority of the hospitals are non-profit organizations? Tell me why. In Italy, they are cooperative, but more or less is the same. Because you have few hospitals which are profit-making, but there are very few, and they will not survive. Because the idea is in an hospital which furnishes services, health services to people, you cannot operate 
with the intention of extracting profit. Uh, that applies to America. In Europe, in Italy, in England, uh, in Germany, they are state-owned. But th we have many other hospitals or clinics uh, which are private, but organized uh, in a cooperative way. Etc. So that is why I said we need different types of firms. I'm not like those who say everybody should be capitalistic or everybody should be cooperative. That is wrong. Because in certain sectors, the cooperative model is superior to the capitalistic and vice versa in other sectors. So this is a very, let's say, pluralistic and liberal way of reasoning without saying that that is the first point. The second <coughs> point is that the principle of democratic stakeholding. Everybody knows what is stakeholding. But the cooperatives, the true cooperatives, they operate in such a way as to realize democratic stakeholding. And that makes a lot of difference. In a corporation, the, the members of the corporation, they, how do they know? How do they control the board of directors? Only once per year. When there is the, in the general assembly, they are asked to approve the balance sheets. But that uh, comes afterwards, not exposed, not exempt. And most of the time, they are not participating because they make their investment for speculative reasons, not because they are interested in the, in the working of the, the company itself. In a corporate, in a true cooperative, the opposite is true because the members of the cooperative exercise a direct control every single week or month of the year. Not only uh, they respond, uh, uh, the board of directors, they respond directly to the asset. That is what is called a democratic stakeholder. Third, a cooperative will always reinvest the profits obtained in the area, in the region where they operate. You will never observe a cooperative making a delocation or outsourcing. No, that is forbidden or by practice. On the other hand, a capitalistic firm starts its factory here. After a while, shut, shut it. it will shut down and move elsewhere. But the cooperative is linked to the territory where it was born. That is a major difference. That is what uh, we consider as the so-called community element. In other words, a cooperative responds uh, to the community. The shareholder, the, sorry, a capitalistic firm responds uh, to the shareholders. And the shareholders, they can uh, live in any part of the world. So in conclusion, we have to become really very, uh, very gentle and liberal, considering that reality is very complex and you cannot capture the totality of the economic reality with only one type of firm. Mm. That is the reason why, for instance, in the States, in the year 2010, they have introduced another, a third typology of firm, what is called benefit corporation. And the benefit corporation is half a way between capitalistic firm and cooperative firm. It's half a way, so to speak. Mm. And why is that so? Because Americans are pragmatic. And being pragmatic, they observe that in certain sectors, the benefit corporation formula is superior to the other two. Mm. And that the purpose of scientists or scholars, economists, and people like you is exactly that to understand sector by sector what is the optimal form of enterprise which should be applied without any attempt of imperialistic attempt of saying this is the best, that is the worst, etc. That, is, in my opinion, is a very, uh, from an epistemological point of view, very unscientific. To conclude, I would like to refer you to the article published in the Economic, uh, sorry, Journal of Economic Literature in November last year, less than one year, by whom? By George Akerlof. 
George Akerlof is an American economist, Nobel Prize winner. And you know who is his wife. She's the Treasury Minister nowadays in the States. Okay, and she was the, the, the general director of International Monetary Fund before, because she too is a, a very good. Now, the title of the article published by Akerlof, you know what is that? Can you imagine? When I read it, I couldn't believe. And since I happen to know him personally, I sent him a, a message of congratulation. The title is the sins of omission of mainstream economics. <laughs> sins. He yeah. didn't say the mistakes, but oh. the sins yeah. of omission. Good, good, Teddy. Spoke. And with that, like, and for everybody who has been uh, listening to us, uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And again, we will speak again uh, uh, very shortly. A number of uh, other interviews coming up with Henry Minsberg, with uh, Paul Adler, with uh, Blaine Fowler, and uh, a few more. So hopefully we will make some inroads, as uh, Stefano was just saying, on our inquiry to make this world a little better. Thank so you. thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Oki. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. You.